My name is Dwayne Arneson. I was born in Rochester, Minnesota back in 1937. Uh, went to Rochester High School. From there, I, I graduated and went on to St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, where I got my degree in physics and math. Upon graduation, I competed in officer training school in the Air Force and was selected to get a commission. Went to officer training school and was commissioned back in 1962. I went on to spend 26 years in the U.S. Air Force as a communication electronics officer and retired in 1986. I had assignments all over the world, including Vietnam, Europe, uh, you name it, I've probably been there. I held a, a top secret SCI TK clearance, that means a special compartmented tango kilo information, which is above top secret, if you will. It takes a special investigation to get that sort of a clearance. Upon graduation, or upon getting out of the Air Force, retiring as a colonel in 1986, I was a director of logistics at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I applied for work at Boeing, and I came to work for Boeing as a computer systems analyst, and I've been working since 1987 in that capacity with Boeing. I have had various opportunities to see things that come through my perusal. For one instance, back in 1962, I was lieutenant at Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany. <coughs> Excuse me. I was a crypto officer for the entire uh, Ramstein Air Base. I was a top secret control officer. And in that capacity, I happened to see a classified message go through my comm center, which said that a UFO has crashed on the island of Spitsbergen, in Norway and a team of scientists are coming to investigate it. I do not recall where the message came from, where it was going to, because in that capacity, we were oftentimes told, what you see here, leave here. But I can recall seeing that. The next thing that comes to mind is one that took place in 1967. I was in charge of the communication center at 28th Air Division at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana. I was, <clears throat> again, the top secret control officer there. I dispatched all the nuclear launch authenticator to the SAC missile crews and whatnot, so I had a very good top secret background to, you know, to go on. One night, or one day, I should say, I happened to see a message that came through my communication center. There again, I cannot quote the date, where it came from, where it was going to, but I do recall reading it and saying that basically that a UFO was seen near missile silo numbers I can't recall, but it was hovering there and it said that the crew going on duty and the crew coming off duty all saw the UFO just hovering in midair. It was a metallic circular object and uh, from what I understand the missiles were all shut down. Since that time, a couple years ago, a friend of mine, a, a Bob Kaminsky, a manager at Boeing who has since passed away, in fact he passed away last year, on the Art Bell Show one night, a guy by the name of Bob Solace called in, and uh, he was talking about this incident, and I said, interesting. He was talking about these missiles being shut down, <clears throat> and then later on that night, Bob Kaminsky, who had retired <clears throat> from Boeing, he called into the Art Bell Show, and he said, yes, I was the manager, or I was the engineer assigned by Boeing to come up and check out the missiles to make certain that they, in fact, had not gone down upon their own. And he said, I gave him a complete bill of health. And I worked for Bob <coughs> in Boeing, and I uh, was a good friend of his. Even before he passed away, we had many, many conversations on the subject. And uh, he was just a very incredible man. And what I mean by missiles going down, they were not in a launch. They were in the missile silos, and they were being I don't know what SAC does as far as activating a missile is concerned, but it's basically on a standby mode, so it can be launched. But when they say it went down, it means that it went dead. And something turned those missiles off. And so they could not be put in a mode of launching. When I was a commander of a radar squadron up in Maine at Caswell Air Force Station, Maine, we were right next door to Loring Air Force Base, which was where they launched the B-52s and the the Casey tankers and things like that. <clears throat> I had a lot of security friends over there at Loring who told me about, and I have no first-hand knowledge of it, but they also had seen UFOs hovering near the uh, nuclear weapons storage area on Loring Air Force Base. 
62, 63 time frame, yes. But it definitely said, being a Norwegian ancestor, I knew about the island of Spitsbergen, Norway. In fact, my ancestors, I haven't done a lot of research, are from that particular neck of the woods. So it kind of keyed my interest when I saw that name. I asked around and the, the powers that be, if they knew about it, which I'm sure they probably read the message, uh, they were told not to, to say anything. They did. It just wasn't talked about. You know, if you talked about that kind of stuff, they would kind of look askance at you and say, you know, what's with this guy? You know, what you saw there, you left there. And uh, it was kind of politically incorrect to do that kind of thing, to talk about it, as you well know. A little bit of background, not to belabor the point, but <clears throat> when I was assigned as director of logistics at Wright Patterson, I left the wife and kids back in Oklahoma City. It was my daughter's last year of high school, so I went out there uh, on my own for about a year. And uh, in the house, in the search for an apartment out there, I came across this lady, Chris Whedon by name, who had a little five acre English kind of manor up outside of Dayton. And she had peacocks and dog well, She had three rooms for rent, three bedrooms. So I rented one and uh, I kind of became her son. I helped her cut the grass. I mowed the lawn, you know, or, and I cut the wood. She was up in her 70s. A little background to that though, <clears throat> her husband, Lieutenant Colonel Spence Whedon, was, I see, he died, this was back in 86 time frame. Now, he died about 12 years prior to that. And from everybody that I met, they said he was just a brilliant guy. He had a photographic mind, and he was one of the lead investigators of UFO stuff at Wright Patterson. In fact, I have a tape at home uh, produced back in the 1950s at the debate between uh, Spencer Whedon and that Major Kehoe, Donald Kehoe. They were actually in a debate, if you will, <clears throat> on that. It was done the Armstrong Circle Theater. But uh, anyhow, he was her husband, if you will. The one person I happened to meet and took quite a shine to, and, and he to me, was a, a Dr. Adolf Rom. Now, he at that time was 83 years old. I think he has since died. Um, one night after, after supper and after a few martinis, I jokingly asked Adolf, I said, uh, what do you know about the little gray men that are supposedly on ice here at Wright Patterson? And I can distinctly recall his face turning ashen white. His voice got very stern and he said, Arnie, he says, all I can tell you is that they were not weather balloons and we will not talk about it again. You understand? And uh, there was no uncertainty in my mind that uh, <clears throat> we wouldn't talk about this further. He also, just for a little background on him, he was from Switzerland originally. He was on their first A-bomb test in the U.S. He knew Dr. Oppenheimer personally and uh, just a, a fine, fine gentleman. But uh, just something that kind of relates to the Roswell thing for what it may be worth. Even though I had a, a top secret clearance, there were areas that we just couldn't get near and we just could not find anything about some of these areas of Wright Patterson that uh, may have held some bodies or who knows what they held. And a lot of my, uh, my technicians that uh, worked for me as a communication electronics officer, they would tell stories about things going across the radar screens at fantastic speeds, you know, they, they, they were not, <clears throat> nothing could go that fast. What years would this have been? Well, this was, this was back in the, in the mid-70s, and then I had that radar squadron commander's job at uh, in Castle Air Force Station, Maine. That's when they, uh, these technicians would tell me about things like that. So the commander of a radar squadron, you have people who are operational types as well as the people who are the technician types who actually maintain the radars. In fact, in that capacity, we would take and uh, have battle exercises. We were the only radar squadron in the U.S. under operational control of the Canadian NORAD division up North Bay, Canada. Now, as I say, we had the, uh, we were oftentimes, you'd see on the radar scopes, you'd see the B-52s coming down from Canada, the fighter interceptors being directed against them and whatnot. So these men, the operational types, knew how fast things were flying. They knew how the speed of bombers, they knew the speed of the current fighter force that we had. Uh, the radar technicians I had, the maintenance men working for me, they were in a position to say, yes, that scope was in A1 condition or the radar is in A1 condition. So things could check out. <clears throat> the experience of the operational types, the experience of the maintenance guys, they confirmed that the system was operating perfectly. 
and they told stories. I didn't see the actual tracks myself go across the radar screens, but they said that thing is going two or three thousand miles an hour. And then I heard it from different stories, different sources that uh, related similar events at different radar stations throughout the U.S. Not just uh, it wasn't just at that Caswell Air Force Station that it happened, but some guys were stationed in California, and we had radar stations back in those days all over the U.S. Since that time, we have been deactivated and turned back over to FAA control. So, but stories like that, not uncommon at all. I think back in those days, the possibility of such a thing being released to the people would probably have caused a lot of uh, social unrest. And because uh, it has religious implications, if you will, it's got social implications, you know. But, but you think about it, all this vast universe we have, if we're the only intelligent life here, God has sure got bad judgment. First thing I did was look in the guard's eye and say, hey, will you tell me the truth about this? Uh, he, this object, and he swore up and down he was telling the truth. I believed, I, you know, for a couple of reasons. I, I, mean, I knew he was frightened when he called me down here, and then when I looked him in the eye and he, uh, you know, he told me about the situation, uh, I certainly believed him. 